Welcome everybody, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight on what is the last of these webinars of the winter series. Uh, we'll have a few months off now uh, during the summer months. Um, with me tonight, I, my name is Ben Wixey, I'm the National Sales Manager for Germinal. And with me tonight is uh, Adam Simper, who's our uh, Account Manager in the Midlands. Paul Morgan, who is the account manager in the South and Southwest, and William Fleming, who is the account manager in uh, the North, the, the, the North East and uh, Scotland. Um, so they're all going to uh, make presentations to you in a minute. Um, I just wanted to say this is the last of the webinars we've got, but if you've missed any of them or you want to go over some of the things we've been looking at, um, please go to the website, germinal.co.uk. Um, at the top of the website is a knowledge hub. And in there, there are webinars that we've done on multi-species, on managing multi-species, on lucerne, on brassicas, on white clover, red clover, the right reseed for you, managing your grass, sward assessments, planning your grazing, um, and then all the herbs as well. There's also guides there. So if anything that you hear tonight pricks your interest, there's also far more in-depth guides on that knowledge hub on, on how to grow clover or how to introduce clover or brassica or, or, or any of the other topics that come up tonight. So um, just, yeah, germinal.co.uk, it's a really useful um, website for uh, all, all that knowledge. Um, we are recording this session because uh, not everybody can make it now. And, uh, and then there we can send out the link. Please ask questions as we go through. Um, uh, there is, if you slide your mouse to the top or the bottom of the screen, you'll get a QA and a uh, box and you can type your question in there anonymously. Um, I will ask, we'll have questions and answers at the end. Um, I have disabled the chat function for tonight because we've had people ask questions in the chat function before, which we've missed during the webinar, and then we can't, uh, get that information or those questions back uh, later on. So uh, I've disabled that. And, and so if you ask questions, do it through the question answers and then we can we can answer them all later if we don't get to them all tonight. Um, and there is a survey at the end of the webinar, which uh, I'd be really pleased if you could just spend two minutes filling that in and give us some feedback on what we've done and, and uh, where you think we ought to go in the future in terms of uh, other webinars. So tonight's webinar on how to fill the forage gap amid the price rises is, is all about, we were having a chat ourselves and we were just thinking that there are, we wanted to discuss the different options within forage and, and homegrown protein, and homegrown forage, and appreciate that some of these topics might not have been that attractive when um, uh, feed and fertilizer were below 300 pound a tonne. Uh, but now, obviously, you know, dairy of cake is, is is pushing towards 400, if not more, and fertilizer is double that, if not more. Um, some of these options that we're going to go through tonight might be now more appealing than they perhaps been in the past. So that's the idea uh, of tonight's webinar. Some of it, for some of you, will be quite old hat. Some of it is not going back to basics, but just re, you know, just going back over those ideas and 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 seeing what can be done on the farm to to help production and, and, and save, save costs. So uh, that's it from me tonight. I'm not gonna do anything more other than raise, do the question and answer at the end. Adam, would you uh, present for us, please, your, your presentation? Yeah, great. Thank you much, Ben. And thank you for the introduction, Ben. Um, good evening to everyone. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, I just want to spend the next kind of 20, 25 minutes talking about red and white clover, really. Um, so, the range of foil crops out there which are, which can introduce onto our farms and that can help reduce costs, um, improve performance, provide traceable, uh, provide traceable homegrown protein um, and at the same time reduce our carbon footprint. Okay, like Ben said, with the volatile feed and fertiliser price at the moment, um, it's probably you know, now more important than ever to reduce our costs, um, be more sufficient from homegrown forage and I believe that clovers, both red and white, can help achieve this in many ways. So by reducing your kind of reliance on, on kind of manufactured uh, nitrogen and bought in protein, you're, you're reducing your carbon footprint, um, you're improving the, um, the output from lower inputs, 
which can further reduce your carbon footprint also. So, like I say, um, the advantage of the clover is really well, we're just gonna, we know that they're gonna fix nitrogen. We'll talk about more of that in a bit. They're um, traceable homegrown protein, so it can help reduce your carbon footprint rather than importing soya, okay? A lot of the organic boys, you know, a lot of the organic farmers, they like to use clovers as a soil fertility builder. You know, that's what they rely on, okay? And also, you know, the, the different rooting structures of clovers, both red and white, can certainly enhance the soil structure and like I say, there's a lot more kind of focus, certainly in the press and, and, and on farm at the moment, about increasing and, and getting that soil structure right um, and organic matters in the soil right, just so that we can produce uh, more sustainable crops going forward. Obviously, the feed quality, we know that the clovers are, are high in protein, they've got high in mineral contents, okay, and that in terms uh, helps kind of annual intake, okay. Clovers, like I say, are high in D value, high in minerals. They, they pass through the rumen more quickly than grasses, so they've got a higher intake potential, which results in improved animal performance, okay? From the, the topics I've just kind of said, it can help reduce um, um, greenhouse gas impact as well. And we also know that clovers, obviously, they, they produce forage in the drier months. So uh, I wouldn't say they're uh, drought prone, but they're tolerant to the, the drier soil types, and they will give you forage and produce your forage over those drier months. They also have um, environmental benefits as well. You know, certainly kind of both red and white clover, they do, they do uh, produce flowering heads and probably more so in, in, in red clover environmental mixtures, you know, they can um, provide an excellent source of nectar to pollinators as well. So we'll start with white clover, um, trifolium repens. Basically, tri is three, folium is leaf. So that's where the name, the name comes from. And with white clover, it grows by stolons. So stolons are like a, a horizontal surface stem, and that can certainly help graze intolerance as well. White clover, it can fix anywhere from 100 and 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. That figure is quite hard to actually um, quantify out in the field. So those type of figures are almost what you kind of see kind of in, in lab and experiments rather than kind of on farm. But that's the type of quantity of nitrogen that is kind of widely known that, uh, that uh, white clover can fix. Then throughout the year, certainly probably later in the, in the year, that clover is then released um, to itself and also 75 to 100 kilos of that is then transferred to the surrounding crops as well. Okay. Once again, we've said it's a homegrown traceable protein, which is, which is massively important nowadays in these volatile markets. We've talked about the high intake of very palatable, good mineral content, good digestibility, and also it's quite versatile. You know, it can, it can grow, grow in kind of um, in, in, in swords with different, you know, other different grasses, uh, other legumes and herbs as well. So things like GS4 mixes, you know, clovers are to count, do count as one of the legume parts as, as GS4. OK, more so uh, red clover than white. But like I say, general multi-species lays um, outside of the schemes, uh, white clover does lend itself nicely to them. In terms of longevity, um, well, as long as you treat it right, it'll, it'll pretty much last as long as you want it to, really. OK, um, so it lasts long term and it grows at eight degrees. So we generally a rule of thumb is three, five, eight. Italian rye grasses grow at three degrees, perennials at five degrees. But clovers, they need a warm in, you know, a warmer soil temperature, eight degrees. And within clover, you want to really match your leaf size to the management you want. So what I what I mean by that is uh, white clover has uh, different leaf sizes, basically small, medium, and large. The smaller the leaf size, okay, the lower the yield, okay. But the smaller the leaf size, the denser the network of stolons, and the more persistent the clover can be under intensive grazing. So obviously then you've got small leaf white clovers for intensive sheep grazing, medium leaf for non-intensive sheep grazing, cattle uh, grazing and cutting. Then large leaf white clovers, obviously they're much higher yielding than small, okay? But they have a, their, 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 net, their, their network of stolons isn't as great as small leaf white clovers. So if you were, if you were gonna graze in intensive sheep grazing, large leaf white clovers, because the um, avitaceous roots are, are less, okay, you can quite easily graze largely white clover out of intensive sheep grazing mixtures. So just bear in mind when you're, you know, when you're, when you're buying a uh, grass mixture, you're buying clover, that you actually are matching your leaf size to the management you want. 
We then obviously put together clover blends to suit different management regimes. Okay, so Abba sheep, as the name suggests, is for sheep grazing. Um, Abba pasture is more kind of small to medium, kind of medium to large for cattle rotational sheep grazing. Then Abba dairy is more than medium to large for cattle and uh, uh, and cutting. Um, Abba lasting then got new breeding. So Abba lasting is from our germinal uh, double root range of clovers, and it grows by both stolons and rhizomes. So this makes it very tolerant for intensive grazing. It's also very drought and cold tolerant also. So you've got the stolons growing above the ground, but under the ground as well, you've also got rhizome, rhizomes growing as well. And that's kind of, you know, like I say, the, the, new, the new range of our double root range. And we are, that's on the market at the moment, is in our mixes at the moment, is out on farm at the moment. But watch this space, I guess, because there will be more kind of germinal double root varieties coming forward. So nitrogen fixation, so um, rhizobia bacteria live in the nodules on the clover roots, okay, and when the bacteria fix in nitrogen, the nodule turns like a reddish pinkish colour, okay, and that's when you know nitrogen, is uh, nitrogen fixation is taking place. Basically, the bacteria take nitrogen gas from the air and they convert it into, into a form of nitrogen that is then used for the plant to grow and also when it's released in nitrogen for the surrounding plants to grow as well. OK, it doesn't, you know, there's different factors that can affect the amount of nitrogen being fixed. OK, obviously, the first one is the amount of the, the amount of clover in the sward already. OK, we generally say as a rule of thumb, you really want about 30 percent clover in your sward to get that 150, 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare um, fixation. OK, um, the amount of bag nitrogen applied as well. You know, if you start um, applying nitrogen all throughout the year as well, the clover will become what's called a lazy fixer. So it's not doing its job. So you really kind of, you know, you, we're relying on the clover plants to, to do a job, save us money, fix nitrogen. So if you're going to stick nitrogen on it as well, you're kind of defeating the object of what the clover plant's doing. OK. And also, like I say, soil temperatures. So... Um, Really, clovers won't start to fix nitrogen, um, or they start fixing nitrogen kind of most, most months of the year, but they won't start to properly fix it and release it uh, until you get into the kind of the warmer, the warmer, you know, summer months, kind of, you know, May, June, July onwards, really. Nit um, uh, clover isn't really going to fix nitrogen over the winter, okay? And um, clover, really, if you, if you, once you've drilled it, it, it's probably fair to say that it won't start fixing nitrogen until kind of six to 12 months into its life. And if you've got clover on your farm at the moment, be it red or white, go out there with a spade, dig some up, wash the roots off with some water, and just see those nodules on the plant. You know, we did dug some up, uh, must have been about five, six weeks ago, where well, it's still relatively cold. And there was nodules on the clover fixing then. So I would I would urge you, just out of interest, just go and dig some dig some plants up and just see those nitrogen fixing nodules on, on the plant. So the clover plant here on the screen, this screen, this is a white clover plant, obviously. Um, and the first root that's put down is what's called a bull root. Okay, and that will disappear over time. The plant will grow through stoloniferous growth. Okay, and the stolon is the horizontal stem um, which runs along the ground. And once established, okay, the stone is, is the growing point of the plant. Okay, so that's where the plant will grow and spread. As the plant grows um, and puts up um, petiolite, which is basically the stalk where the leaf comes from, okay, that will that will that leaf will, will grow up from the from the stolon. Along the stolon, you have then small nodes, okay, and as the stolon is growing and creeping along the ground, these no uh, and these nodes are between the leaf stalk. Where the nodes basically touch the ground and touch the soil, that's when what's called the advantageous roots are formed. OK, so you can see there on the picture, you've got two roots forming. They're the advantageous roots. OK, and they that's those roots there are what anchor the plant to the ground. And this will, uh, you know, this this allows a plant to keep growing and spreading throughout the field. We do see uh, clover dominance in some swords and more cutting, you know, more kind of, dare I say, it, cutting sword, uh, cutting uh, uh, mixtures as opposed to grazing, because generally with grazing management, you shouldn't be grazing it down to bare boards anyway. But like I say, we do see clover dominance and we'll probably have a question on that a bit, a bit later. So this is some uh, trials work from Mike Egan and, and Chegas Moorpark, okay, on the animal benefits um, on dairy cows on 
Um, a grass only sward uh, with 250 kilos of nitrogen applied. Grass and clover spores with 150 kilos of nitrogen applied. Okay, so as you can see there, the total dry matter yield is, is there or thereabouts. They're both fairly similar. But you can also see that the milk yield and the milk solids are much higher. Okay, in the grass and clover with only 150 kilos of nitrogen as, a pass, as opposed to the grass only with 250 kilos of nitrogen. So that clover plant is doing a lot there in fixing nitrogen to get the same type of yields there and increasing milk yield and increasing milk solids as well. Okay. You'll also see there that the silage fed is obviously greater in the grass and clover um, as opposed to the rye grass only. Okay, so this is the reason why this clover doesn't uh, do much for it in the spring. Okay, it needs higher temperatures than grass. So a spring deficit in feed availability on farm um, can happen where there's a lot of clover in the swords. And this just needs to be offset with kind of concentrate or silage, um, like I say, as highlighted in the trial. We then got lamb animal, um, animal uh, performance benefits, and this is work uh, done by Philip Craigen in Chegas. Okay, this here, the stocking rate was about 11 ewes per hectare. And once again, you can still see no real difference in kilos of dry matter per hectare, it's still fairly the same. But the clover is doing a lot of work here. It's feeding the sward, it's fixing nitrogen, it's maintaining grass production throughout the year. And what that has allowed us to do, okay, or what that has allowed the, the farmer in the trial to potentially do is to um, reduce the, the age of lamb at slaughter, okay? So, sorry, reduce the days of lamb at slaughter. So you can finish stock a lot quicker from grass and clover with nitrogen, with 90 kilos of nitrogen applied as opposed to a grass only. And surely if you can finish stock quicker, it allows you to A, potentially have a higher stocking rate or B, put that grass field into something else, which will then capitalize from homegrown forage and potentially make you more you know, profitable from that hectare of ground. This is some uh, work taken um, from our multi-species trials work, which was carried out at Germinal Horizons Wiltshire, okay? And um, this is basically showing the, the, the crude protein summary of uh, white clover, red clover, alcyke, black medic, uh, chicory, and plantain. So I appreciate, you know, the last three, they're not, uh, they're not clovers, not legumes, they're herbs. But what I wanted to put across here is, as you can see here, you know, the early, mid, and late. Early is kind of what we call a first cut in April. Mid is kind of a cut four, early July. And late is kind of cut six at late August. So all throughout the year, the white clover is producing high levels of crude protein, okay? And red clover, yes, it's slightly uh, lower uh, to get going early in the spring and, and maybe mid, but certainly later on in the season, as we typically know, you know, red clover will start to, to kind of dominate and, and increase that crude protein content. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because we generally think uh, of um, clovers uh, as protein and fixing nitrogen. But also, once again, in the trial down at uh, German Horizon Wiltshire, we also then um, separated the individual species and took them to ME yield as well. And interestingly, um, we've seen that, you know, both uh, certain, well, certainly white clover going through here and, and red to extent, you know, the ME content of the, of the white clover here is really high, much higher than we probably even th thought about. You know, early on it's 12.2, you know, mid to, mid to late is 11.2, 11.5. So dare I say it, those ME kind of figures there, um, those ME contents is probably higher than some perennial ryegrass mixtures out there in the field at the moment. So we need to start maybe thinking of clovers as, A, yes, fixing nitrogen, fantastic. B, producing protein, we know that, but also C, um, an energy content as well, okay? Management, so soil fertility is really important as clover is quite a fussy plant um, and the soils need to be right. You know, in an ideal world, I'd say the soil pH wants to be seven. Realistically, we're probably not gonna find many soils at a pH of seven. So we dare generally say kind of pH of six and 6.3 and above, if you can, and P and K indexes of two. OK, so you want to focus on getting your pH correct before you start trying to introduce clover onto your farm. 
Okay, we've talked about soil temperatures, they need to be eight degree and rising for, for um, uh, clover to start growing. Okay, and so at the end of April to August. Okay, um, May onwards is where clover will contribute the most in the lay. And like I say, that's purely because the soil temperatures are rising then. Um, in new swards, don't build up huge covers on new reseeds, okay, as it will shade out the clover. You want to allow a bit of sunlight to get down to those clover plants just so they can photosynthesize, get the advantageous roots down, grow by stolons and walk that work their way through this through the sward and, and, and be kind of more persistent and just compete against, or not compete, but just grow alongside that grass. Okay. Good grass and management. Um, well, you know, grazing, you know. It's, it's quite straightforward, you know, graze down to, you know, 1500 kilos of dry matter per hectare, you know, that's about four centimetres. Don't don't scalp it down to bare boards, um, because as William will talk about in his presentation, you know, the right grass and management, grass will grow grass. OK, I've got here clover safe herbicides. Um, look, I'm not an agronomist. Um, I think there's probably one um, spray available, but I would certainly speak to your agronomist about what um, clover safe sprays or spray should I say they have available to you and the, the other thing you could do if you do think you are going to have a bit of a weedy field okay um, once you've you know cultivated drill a no clover sward okay sort the weeds out with relatively cheap chemical and then at a later date okay once the uh, you know once the residual um, any residuals or spray residuals are gone stitch your clover in at a later date so sort your weeds out Make sure there's no residuals on the spray, then introduce your clover later on then. Okay, and that's a, a, another way if you don't want to go down the, the, the herbicide route of uh, clover safe sprays. Full reseed, well, probably to get clover established, um, the best way to get clover established is, is a full reseed. You know, it's like anything really. Okay, so you want to spray, create a firm, find seabed. If you're not ploughing, okay, and you're just going to um, uh, desiccate and round up off and, and, you know, try and drill into that, you want to make sure that you remove all that surface trash, okay? And also, you want to make sure that you lime to raise the pH, and also that will stop the acidity of the dying grass. Even if your pH to six and a half, I still recommend putting lime on, and like I say, just to purely neutralise that, that acidity of that, of that dying grass, okay? Main thing though, really, like grass seed as well, uh, clover likes a real um, a firm, fine seabed. So in rates, generally with grass, you want to probably go on at 13, 14 kilos, and then your clover inclusion is anywhere from one to one and a half kilos, okay? Some land or some fields can grow clover really well, so one clover will be more than enough. Others really struggle, so you could go as up to two, okay? And those fields that are probably struggling, it could well be just because the pH isn't quite right, and the P's and K's aren't quite right, okay? And to get maximum seed to soil contact, um, you know, you wanna make sure you roll before and after sowing, okay? This will help consolidate the seabed, conserve moisture, uh, and like I say, just make sure that seed is, is, is getting in great contact with the soil, um, which will obviously give you a better establishment. Overseeding, um, it's probably fair to say we're seeing a lot of interest in overseeding uh, white clover at the moment, uh, more so, and, and sales are, are much greater than, than previous years. Um, and like Ben's uh, said at the very beginning, you know, it's because of the, the, the fertiliser price. People are, are looking and are wanting to be more self-sufficient in terms of their, or, or, you know, in terms of their inputs and be more profitable um, from what they do. And you, you can do that by reducing your input costs from, from nitrogen and allowing white clover certainly to help you um, fix that nitrogen uh, and uh, just help you be more sufficient, okay? There are many factors that um, potentially could make overseeding unsuccessful um, and timing's important. You know, you're only thinking kind of, you know, weather dependent on, and every year is different, but kind of, you know, March, April, July, August, I would say, I would think probably May and June, uh, that's when grass growth is, is most vigorous. So they're not the great, you know, the great months because you're going to try and get a young clover plant established into a very aggressive grass growing sward. And the two just don't go hand in hand. The, you know, the, the, the grasses that are established are just going to outcompete the clover. You want to make sure that the, the, the sward is open and you can see a bit of soil. OK, uh, you can do this after a tight grazing or, or cut as well. So at about a kilo and a half to the acre overseeding, okay, 
And I've got here, don't drill, drill too deep. In, in my opinion, okay, I would um, use harrows or an iron harrow to over sow clover into existing sward. I just think there's less chance of the seed being drilled too deep. Clover is a really small seed. Scratch it on the surface, that's all it needs. If it goes in 20 mil an inch, it's gone in way too deep. You just won't see anything. So, like I say, I, I think Harrow's gives it uh, a better chance of establishing in an existing sward. Okay. You can then roll or put your put your light stop back in to help tread it in. Okay. But just remember if you do put the stop back in, remember to take them out after five to seven days. Otherwise, once the clover starts to establish, potentially sheep light stock will start to graze it. And if the root structure is not established fully, you'll just pull those, uh, those clover seedlings out. And obviously, don't spread nitrogen and fertilizer. Um, obviously, all you do there is the encourage the existing grass to grow like stink and it will outcompete the clovers. Potential issues then. Okay, so we've got poorer growth in the spring. You know, we've said that clover needs a warmer soil temperatures, so nitrogen fixation happens uh, generally later in the year. So for that, we do need a bit of a tactical end application to get grass moving to, to enable it to, you know, to get to get the first cut that we want. OK. Um, clover, like I said, can dominate in swords, so avoid tight cutting. OK, um, there can be potential bloat issues. OK, so animals haven't been on clover swords before. Um, and if there's a high proportion of clover, you know, animal stock can get bloat. Um, so really, you know, don't turn them out hungry or when they're, or, you know, early in the morning when the, the forage is kind of, you know, dewy and slightly wet. OK, feed fibre with the diet as well. Or you can also introduce bloat oil to the water as well. OK, so just be careful on bloat as well. Probably more so of an issue on red rather than white, but it, but it is a legume and it, it can happen. And we've talked about weed control, you know, speak to your agronomist, think about using a no clover version first and then stitching your clover in at a later date. Red clover now. OK, so as you can see from the, the, the picture on, on, the, on the screen here, um, red clover grows completely differently to white clover. So it grows by a, a taproot. OK, and that taproot can be really, you know, it, it's really deep. And, and when I dug that, uh, that picture up there or that uh, plant up there, I actually snapped the root off because it was so, you know, going so deep. So it does have a much deeper rooting system than, than white clover. And it doesn't spread by stolons like like um, white clover does as well. Okay, the um, red clover is mainly uh, mainly kind of grown for conservation, so its yields are kind of three to four that of white clover. So it's very high yielding, you know, almost up to you know you know grass levels, ten to fifteen tons of dry matter per hectare. It can be used in mixed wards or monocultures. Okay. Um, we have seen a few people growing straight red clover. It has its issues, it has its benefits, um, but generally, general rule of thumb, it'll be in, 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 in swords with, with, with grasses as well. Same type of nitrogen fixation, so 150 to 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. And then once again, same as white clover, around about 70 to 200 kilos is transferred, okay? Also what um, red clover and white clover does to be fair as well is, when you turn it over and plow it in for the following crop, it leaves residual end in the in the soil there. So that following crop will benefit massively, and we see it time and time again. You know, swords or, or, or crops or species, um, seals, anything like that, lucerne seals, following red clover or, or, or white clover, they do tremendous just purely because of the um, residual nitrogen that those clover plants are leaving. It also has um, what's called PPO, so polyphenol oxidase, and this is an enzyme that, that protects basically the protein through the rumen, and it then takes it through into the abomasum. Now, the abomasum is a more acidic um, stomach, uh, and the bacteria there are breaking down the protein more efficiently, meaning improved animal performance. OK, so that's massively important in red clover, where we're actually utilising more of that protein in the in the abomasum as opposed to the to the rumen okay um it's obviously shown to improve milk yields as we've seen and live weight gain on on in new condition in, 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 in new conditions should i say sorry once again obviously it's homegrown traceable protein and that's what farmers are looking for now you know gone are the days where like ben said you know you can buy things in now and, and it's at very cheap prices 
we have to grow our own protein, we have to grow our own energy, and protein and energy and yield is what drives livestock production, okay? Once again, we've mentioned it's a soil fertility builder, okay? And the organic guys like to use it for that reason as well. And also, like I say, the environmental benefits. We are going down more of an environmental way of farming. Um, if you like it, if you don't, that's kind of the way how we're going. Obviously, we do need to, you know, we need to, need to feed ourselves as well, but the environment is very important and it does, uh, you know, give that flowering head, which will obviously um, provide excellent source of, of nectar to pollinators as well. Oh, persistency, okay. So as you can see here from the photo, um, this is what's called the crown of the plant. So red clover grows by a crown and all the new growth comes, comes up from that crown. So it can be fairly vulnerable to grazing damage, okay. And particular from larger animals and if the ground is wet or over the winter as well. Traditionally grown for two or three harvest seasons. So the longevity generally is only for you know, two, or, two or three seasons. And that would be the more the older varieties, but Germinal have got in their um, in their Germinal Red Clover portfolio um, a five year and you know a new five year lasting four to five year lasting variety, which has been a bit of a game changer in the uh, in the Red Clover world. It just allows rotations to you know have a couple of extra years into Red Clover, um, and that suits people massively. And you can certainly then start to use different types of grasses in there. Which will benefit um, benefit your farm as well. Um, Germinal's uh, red clover breeding program has uh, obviously considerably improved the persistency, um, and like I say, with the correct management the last four or five years. You have to treat them right, though. Whether it's a two to three year red clover or a five uh, four to five year red clover, if you graze them over the winter, if you expose that crown, and you you will you will reduce the persistency of that plant. So, like I say, whether it's two or three years or four or five year red clover, um, make sure the management is correct. We've obviously got some uh, um, some new breeding going on, uh, uh, and that's the Stoniferous red clover. So it's in our Germinal Red Runner brand, okay. And these are red clovers that are being bred um, with Stoniferous um, properties as well. So. We're actually the, the team over at Ibers, David and his David Lloyd and his team have bred, um, like I say, red clovers that do grow by stonals as well. And we're not there commercially with the market yet, but I guess it's watch this space um, three, four, five years, uh, and and all being well, they should be on the market. And like I said before, I've mentioned it before, but management is the key for consistency. Don't graze over the winter, don't cut it too tight as you will expose the crown and you will reduce the persistency of that plant. Potential issues, okay. Um, so the, the white clover, you'll probably get away with sowing kind of year depending, early September in certain parts of the world. In Williams part of the world probably is too late, but certainly where I am, you know, white clover will go in then. With red clover, it wants to be established, depending on what you are in the, in, in the country, early, mid to late um, August, okay? So it wants to be established before the winter. Pests, mostly Scalateria and Sten nematode, which are both fungal diseases. Uh, they're both soil-borne, uh, soil um, and therefore kind of clovers need to be grown in a rotation to prevent the buildup of these pests and diseases. So what we generally say, they, with red clover, you want a five-year break. OK, so you want a five year rotation um, and you probably want to extend that to seven years if you see major pests and diseases uh, encountered in the in, in, in this in the soil. OK, white clover can be used as a break crop. So there's no reason why you can't grow uh, white clo clover after red clover. And obviously, just depending on what your what your um, rotation is, select the suitable variety in terms of how long it's going to potentially last. OK, so you can't grow red clover after red clover after red clover, because like I say, it will just build up these, these um, sclenoteria and stem nematode fungis in, in, the, in the soil, okay? Um, don't graze over the winter. Like I say, you just expose the crown and kill the plant. We've talked about bloat, you know, don't put um, hungry animals onto, onto red clover swords. Um, uh, don't turn them out, like I say, when, when the forage is slightly wet, you want to feed fiber as well. Um, and feed a bloat, a guard, or an anti-bloat additive in the water. And also, um, it, 
you know, red clover contains phytoestrogens, and this can affect the fertility in your in your breeding ewes. So generally, we'd say keep your breeding stock off six weeks either side of topping. Um, yeah, and, and you should be fine. There is, I think, some research being done at the moment with phytoestrogens and red clover. But like I say, I think we're just going to watch this space at the moment. And I'll always just still recommend at the moment um, keeping that, you know, your breeding use off six to week, six to weeks, either side of topping. Nutritional um, comparison. So we won't go, I won't go through all the parameters here as they're fairly similar. I just wanted to highlight the one in bold, the crude protein, okay? So protein there for, we've got here basically average grass silage and average red clover silage. And as you can see here, the crude protein in average grass silage is 10 to 16. So 10 is probably what, pit silage, 16 is probably good quality bale silage. Um, and there's a huge variation in grass silage. But red clover, okay, red clover silage is consistently higher in protein. As you can see, it's 15 to 19. So why wouldn't you potentially grow red clover silage or, red clover, or have red clover in your sward for silage? Because the protein content of it there is much higher. And to be fair, the ME of it is there or there about slightly higher as well. And we all know that crude protein and ME and yield drives livestock production. Um, so I won't go any more about that slide there, but I'll just move on to then grazed red clover and, and straight rye grass and lamb performance. So here we've got um, some trials done at, over at Abrissa and Ibers there. Okay, um, red clover swords and just pure rye grass swords only. And as you can see from the red clover swords, the growth rate per day is higher, days to finish is higher. Um, uh, sorry, days to finish is lower, sorry, should I say. Um, eye muscle depth is higher. Substantial so fat depth is, is higher, cold carcass weight is higher, and the main thing here, killing out percentage is higher as well, okay? So you'll get in much um, better growth rates, quicker, nine days quicker to finish, okay, and a higher killing out percentage. So it's killing out percentage that's, that's um, you know, the be all end all for farmers, dare I say it. And as you can probably see from these slides here, you know, red clover, and we see it time and, ten, time and time again, red clover is almost like a bit of a rocket fuel for livestock. Establishment, um, like I said before, the, the plant wants to be well established before the winter, okay? Whether it's conventional way or overseeding, same as, as white clover, it wants a firm, fine seabed. Um, pH is of, like I say, 6.3 and above, indexes of two, okay? Soil temperatures, make sure they're eight degrees and rising. And so at the end of April, okay, and, and mid, uh, you know, mid August, let's say, but depending on where you are in the world, the further north you go, that might want to be early August. And like I say, don't drill, drill too deep. Uh, red clover seed is actually slightly bigger. The size of it is slightly bigger than white clover, but you still want to be just scratch it on the surface. Don't drill it too deep. 10 mils max is, is more than suffice. So drilling as of uh, white clover is the best way to get clover established and full reseed. We've gone through it with white clover, you know, spray, create a firm fine seabed. Um, if you're not ploughing, obviously think about lime just to uh, address the acidity problems of the decaying grass. Um, um, you would like to say, create a firm fine seabed, roll before drilling. Grass inclusion on the, in, in a seed rate is generally about nine to 10 kilos of grass and about three kilos of red clover, okay? Uh, roll before and after sowing, and like I say, that'll just help uh, conserve moisture, great um, maximum seed soil contact, and that will then in turn give you a better establishment. We've talked about a weedy field, you know, um, I, I think there is a spray different to the white clover, there is a spray available um, for red clover. I'm not sure how effective it is, I'm not sure how potent it is on the, on the red clover, but please talk to your agronomist about um, red clover safe sprays, okay, because it will be different to white clover safe sprays, or once again, think about putting a no clover version first, and, no clover version in first, and then putting your clover in at a later date. And if you're overseeding, generally, there's no real right or wrong answer. I mean, I'll put three kilos there. It depends on what you're trying to do, you know, two kilos, three kilos, I think that will be suffice to try and get um, clover established in an existing sward. Like I say, it is a bigger seed than white clover, so you don't get as many seeds per kilo of, uh, of seed. 
grazing. We're on the home straight now. You're pleased to hear. Um, so, as we've seen there's in the, in the slide, you know, previously there's a high killing out percentage as seen in the trial, um, and that's um, a, a, a massive benefit. Um, and you know, red clover, great, you know, grazing red clover with with um, lambs is fantastic. Like, lambs just fatten really well on red clover spores. Okay, um, just be careful. Like I say, they have got phytoestrogens. And what can affect the fertility of your breeding stock, so keep your breeding stock out six weeks before um, and after tubbing. Okay, we've talked about grazing in wet conditions, don't graze in wet conditions, don't graze in the autumn, in, in, the, in the winter. Okay, avoid bloat, you know, um, don't put them into excessive covers on, on red clover, don't turn them out hungry, don't turn them out, you know, you know in dewy mornings. Think about, you know, bloat blocks or, or, or bloat oils. Um, and also to to um, kind of reduce the persistency, um, or sorry, to increase the persistency, um, don't damage the crown, okay? It has a crown, it is quite delicate. As soon as you expose that crown, um, you will quite dramatically reduce the persistency of that plant, okay? So do avoid grazing in the winter. Conservation then, um, cut kind of, you know, depending where you are, kind of cut kind of May onwards really, um, and, and, and historically, they're going kind to of used to say you know, cut it when 50% of the field is in flower. But if you're aiming for quality um, and you're looking for persistency, okay, as soon as you see that first flower, you want to start cutting it. Okay, you don't want to cut it down, um, you know, too low. So you know, seven to eight centimeters, and that will certainly help protect the crown. But try not to kind of drive over all over the field with your tractors and trailers. Because you and, and certainly a low mower height, because that will you know damage your crown and then affect the persistency of the red clover. You want to allow it to flower at least once a year, so it can um, it can send some energy reserve, energy reserves down into its roots and just help it survive over the winter a bit better and get it going a bit earlier in the spring. And avoid excess wilting. Um, you want to be using, if you can, um, uh, um, a uh, rubber conditioner. Okay. Don't tear out because you'll, all you'll do is you'll shatter the leaf, okay, and that's where the protein is. So if you're if you're telling out and you're turning it all the time and it's drying out, um, you will increase the leaf shatter and reduce the amount of protein going in. So generally, I'll probably say you know on a real hot day, you know, 24 hour wilting period, but you know more like probably 36 to 48 hours maximum wilt, okay. And that's it, me done. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Adam. There's um, a lot of information in there. Um, one question, well, several questions come in, one of which uh, I'm going to leave for William to answer when he covers it in terms of the cutting height, William. I don't know if you've seen that question. Um, is there enough clover seed, Adam? There's, there's talk, there's, you know, there's, there's people asking if they've heard that the clover seed's short. Yeah, look, well, we've seen... Um we've seen a dramatic kind of increase in sales and um, inquiries on, on, on clovers even now compared to previous years. Is it going to be tight? We have, a, we have enough to, to see us through. Um, I would say we don't know what's around the corner. Um, demand is looking to be strong. I would think about if you're looking to in, introduce clover into your swords or put a clover sword in, um, I would look to think about putting your name on something sooner rather than later. Um, We've, like I say, we've got enough at the moment, but going forward, you know, we're only in April, you come to August, um, who knows where the market's gone and, and the demand has gone. So um, we're okay at the moment, but I would think about putting your name on something sooner rather than later. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, Paul, are you uh, ready? Can you uh, share your presentation with us, please? Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. <clears throat> right. You know, I'm uh, just going to talk about brassicas now. Um, we're with the price increase of fertilizer, farmers are now looking uh, for a way to cut back on their bag use. So, knowing this, we'll need to try and fill a forage gap that's going to occur. You know, so brassicas are a cheap um, to grow product. You know, you're looking at four to six p per kilo of dry matter. So they surely should be part of that answer for the farmers. Um, 
you know, also helping with lots of other things as well. You know, the need of reducing these bought in feeds, also reducing labour and housing costs. Um, the other part of it, which people forget, is the health benefits. So there's less disease. You've got less uh, vet bills over those winter months. Or it could be as simple as just rotating the field uh, ready for the reseed for the following season. Selecting the correct variety is important because you, if you're going for a main crop, you need to make sure that you sow it at, by at least the end of June uh, for, uh, for a grazing for autumn or winter. So you need to work out in your head when you need to utilize it and then work back to the sowing date to get that right. Um, <clears throat> I can see a lot more brassica grown this year to ensure we have enough feed on farm for this winter. Or if you select a catch crop, you need to sow between May and August. For you to take advantage of that, you know, you can have a bit of summer grazing within eight weeks, or this may just be, be, be there just to help out with the top up of your forage stocks for the autumn. Whichever it is, just try and make sure you select carefully. When looking at a variety selection, select for a superior leaf to stem ratio. This, uh, there's two different varieties here, ours on the left. Um, you know, you can see that it's got fantastic leaf to stem ratio, where obviously there's a lot of waste to the right, uh, the, the crop on the right. Uh, you know, you, when you're looking for a variety, you need to look for a, a, a variety that's vigorous early growth to just, you know, blast out of the ground and get growing. Um, you know, and also you need that resistance to lodging, you know, and sometimes, you know, the other main part is looking for something that will be winter hardy as well. The great thing with these brassicas is that long utilization period, which is really, really helpful. You know, br brassicas are a great, you know, great uh, a product and they can help animal performance by being a healthier, you know, having those animals outside, obviously not having so many bugs being shut into housing. Ideally, so in these brassicas, you know, when soil temperatures are around about 10 degrees C and increasing, but it depends on the timing and crop type. So if sowing in August, uh, you know, looking for like a hybrid variety, you'd be seed rate around about two to three kilos per acre. Um, it'd be more obviously if you use broadcast, if you broadcast, but if you're using a drill, it can be slightly less. But the big thing really is monitoring that crop, you know, is most important because you get it in the ground watch out for those, you know, the flea beetles, slugs, sawfly and cabbage whites, you know, it can be very devastating to that crop. Brassicas grow successfully in many situations, but for the optimum results, choose a really good field where you're likely to achieve the best results in terms of performance. Uh, you know, you might be looking just for field rotation or just a need of a break, but, you know, or ready just for a change, but just make sure that the brassica, there's not been any brassicas grown in that uh, field for at least five years before you make a start. The key, the key things with the field is you want to be looking for a free draining site. You don't want it to be waterlogged to have any problems. You want to make sure it's free draining, especially for outwintering. You know, so you, you don't want it near a, a water course, you know, or you know, an adequate, at least put an adequate buffer in there to try and seep out, you know, take any of that seepage up. The big thing really is avoiding any fields that are too steep which sometimes is a bit of a challenge in Wales, but uh, yeah, you preferably don't want anything too steep and having runoff. So you'd be, you'll also be looking for like a natural shelter. So that, you know, for the livestock to try and get out of that severe weather. So you might be looking for a wall, a hedge, a bank, or even just a wood for them just to get out of the bad weather, you know, uh, in those winter months. Soil testing, good time. You know, the big thing really is, you know, when, before you make a start, you've got to be looking for a soil test uh, and you're looking for a pH of around about 5.8 to 6.5 optimum. So the big thing really is avoiding applying lime at sowing, because especially with Swedes, it's going to really affect that uh, and restrict that uptake of minor elements. And the key one really obviously with Swedes is boron. So you have to be slightly careful with that one. Uh, weeds uh, spray off for glyphosate. You can use a stale uh, seed bed or with grass lays, spray off cover around about eight to 10 centimeters and then graze down hard about five to seven days later. Alternatively, if you've got a bigger crop there, make hay or silage, you know, try and utilize that because you've got it there and try not to waste it. For a typical establishment program, so you're looking really like for spraying off, you glyphosate uh, when the pasture is around about 2000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And after five days, you graze it hard down really to the board to try and remove any of that trash that's there. 
uh, and try and keep it clear. The big thing then is when you're applying the fertilizer, really rely on that soil test to make sure you're putting the nutrients that's really needed there. You know, the big thing when you're doing your preparation for your soil, you know, prepare a fine, firm seed bed. Now, you don't want it all fluffy. You want it really you know, tight in there. Uh, and so you can get really good seed to soil contact, which Adam's talked about before. If you're plowing, cultivate, you can then broadcast or drill or seed harrow, but then roll. Make sure it's firm. You know, firm that, that seed bed down really nice. Direct drilling. We always hear our farmers, you know, direct drilling, straightforward. Um, it is straightforward as long as you don't drill it too deep. You know, remember, we're only looking at one centimetre deep only. In the, and it needs to be in that surface and then obviously then roll. But the key thing really is seed rate would be looking at around about five to seven and a half kilograms per hectare. But again, the soil temperature must be 10 degrees C or up. You know, with this conventional or uh, direct drilling, the big thing is you get it in the ground, wonderful, but then monitor that crop onwards then. You just don't, you know, just because it's in the ground, don't forget about it. Please ensure you get a soil test. This, you know, I've rattled about it already, but you know, the soil test is imperative to make sure your levels before, you know, you find out your levels before working out nutrient requirement. You know, brassicas, they love to have uh, phosphate because that's, you know, really get a good response out of them. But put it in the seedbed if you're going to do it, not afterwards. Uh, and when we talk about fulfilling requirement, you know, nutrient requirement, don't forget we can use FYM and slurry as well as bagged. Stubble turnips, you know, our variety is Valenda. It's, you know, it's a great opportunity crop for top up. You know, if you need to try and top up your forage reserves, fantastic product for that. Uh, for, for, you know, you can have it in for the needs of the summer or the autumn. Real good product. Also helpful having a crop that can raise in those drier months as well. We, we've got a product called Appin, absolutely fantastic, you know, good in drought conditions, a very, very leafy product with a very small bulb. And the great thing with this is only eight weeks to the first grade, so quite rapid on that from that point of view. And the good thing with this one, if you back fence when you're, when you're grazing it, you can possibly multi-graze it as well to get a bit more out of it. Hybrids, I absolutely love our hybrids. We've got a um, Swift and Red Start, really leap up out of the ground for, you know, for a forage, you know, up out of the ground, 100 days to maturity, are real helpful as well for the fact it's so rapid. It also can, you know, it doesn't completely eradicate the problem, but can help with pests. But it's just that sheer power of it coming up out of the ground and a way to go. Really good ME and crude protein in this one. So, and also with this one, if you back fence it, um, you can multi-graze and you can get a regrowth for around about 50%. Maris Kestrel, a great dry matter yield of up to about 14 tonnes and can help a lot of your stock uh, over those autumn and winter uh, months. You can hold a hell of a lot on the ground. It's a very winter hardy variety, real, real good variety that we've got there with that triumph. You know, we, we talk, um, not triumph, sorry, um, with regards to Swedes triumph, you know, we are very, very popular in mid Wales with keeping lambs and ewes in great condition. Um, the Swede is the, the Swede Triumph is absolutely fantastic from that point of view. The winter can hold a hell of a lot of stock on small acreage, and that's why the, the Midwellians they absolutely love it. When we talk about uh, feeding systems, you know, how much are you feeding? This, this is going to help to achieve the desired weight gain, and it also helps you estimate on how long the crop is going to actually last you and the sort of numbers that you'll be able to hold on the ground as well and the length of time. So you also need to be able to calculate how much crop and cost per kilogram of dry matter. So costing of holding of uh, specific animals for how many days, weeks, months it will be, and enable you to work out the profitability of, of a specific stock. So always feed fiber also when you're grazing. It's, and it's really, really important to make sure you get plenty of fiber in there as well. And, you know, the other thing with regards to making sure that you've got plenty of water tanks in the field, you know, people, you know, they forget about the water. We need to make sure that your livestock aren't actually walking too far um, to get water. So the more, the merrier. And that will really help when they're grazing through. So they're not walking back and forth. They'll actually stay at, at the front uh, of the feed front and keep grazing. Um, we talk about allowing for a run back area for animals to lie down and try and stay clean. Um, it's really, really helpful if you've got a field next door that they can run back into. If you haven't, leave a strip down the side of the field that you haven't cultivated or anything else in grass 
and it's just a way of them getting back off off their uh, the brassica crop and and just having a bit of a lie down in the clean it just helps from the appearance point of view as well um you know we need to make sure we ensure we have free access to fiber at all times when they're grazing it's really really helpful to make sure that happens minerals you know you're looking at copper selenium and iodine and vitamin e are essential so you might have to supplement that well you will need to supplement that with tubs or boluses it's completely your preference but it needs to make sure that's supplemented when we talk about fiber, uh, you know, fiber concentrations in brassicas are typically um, below what's considered optimal for room and function. So they also uh, contain relatively high um, levels of sugar. So please ensure fiber is offered when grazing brassicas. We're looking at like straw, hay, silage. All it is is to help stimulate that scratch factor in the rumen. When, um, ensure when you place your bales, you place the bales in the field at the start of the crop, avoiding causing compaction and mess. We don't want to be making a mess in those uh, winter months. And it's not helpful also having a mess in the field with cross compliance. So, yeah, try and avoid that. The big thing really is the big rule is no driving tractors in the crop once the bales are in and the brassica is sown. That's it. When you're feeding minerals, low in copper and selenium and iodine. Um, Copper potential deficiency, obviously, in cattle, particularly in late gestation. Um, Brassicas may also be containing a, you know, like a high level of sulfur, which also challenges that uptake of copper. For maximum utilization, always strip graze or block graze. You should always feed fiber, minerals, move the animals onto fresh crop every day. And you know, see this uh, whirly gig here, this funny mechanism in front. This gives you a, a meter a day, so a hundred meter feed face with a fresh weight of around about five kilograms per square meter and at a dry matter of about 15 to 20 percent. They are approaching one kilogram of dry matter per square meter or a hundred kilograms of dry matter between the 30 to 40 cows. So it's important to know how much you're feeding and uh, when you're grazing. And as I said, move the fence every day. You know, giving those long, fresh, um, thin strips or blocks to get the best utilization out of that brassica. Stocking rates to give you a bit of a feel then. So if we have a number of animals, we're looking at probably around about 60, average weight of 450 kilograms. You know, daily dry um, dry matter requirement is about 13.5 kilograms, 80 percent, which is around about 10.8 kilograms. Total feed requirement for 60 is 650 kilograms of dry matter of brassica a day. So the crop potential, the key thing really is weigh that crop. So you do a meter square, <clears throat> work it out, and then times six kilograms of 15% dry matter is 0.9 kilograms of uh, dry matter per day. So you're looking around about 725 square meters a day to, to give you a bit of a guide. When we talk about integrating brassicas into your farm system, there's three main questions that help you decide which brassica to grow and when and what and how. So brassicas can utilize from early summer around to spring, providing high quality gra uh, grazing. And the good thing with it is a cheap cell feed system. It's done, you know, they do it for themselves. Ask yourself which one, um, you know, when you, when you need to feed and work your way back, like I said, right at the beginning, when you need to utilize it and then work back to your sowing date so you know when. And what and where can they be used in your farming system? It's important to have a, like a, a cropping plan uh, or utilization, you know, really it's got to fit in that bigger farm picture because um, it's, it's no good if it doesn't work. It's got to work in the a bigger farm picture for you. And, you know, when you're looking to decide how many um, animals you want to put on, um, you know, how, how many uh, you want to put on what age, um, what you know, you work out then roughly what dry matter you need to, to fulfill, and that will help you pick the right crop um, for the requirement. On summary, your know, planning is key with brassicas. If you're trying to uh, you know do this job the first time you've ever grown a brassica, plan it out. Don't do it last minute. It must be done. You know, a bit of time to do, uh, to get it all planned out right. Start early. Think of soil testing really early doors. Uh, and, and work out what nutrient requirement you need, if any. Uh, you know, keep it simple, but ensure the attention to detail is done and get it, you know, try and get it as right as you can. Uh, there's massive benefits from using a brassica. And what's fantastic about it is, is a cheap self-feed forage, which I think 
this year we are going to really need uh, some sort of uh, top up for definitely our forage stocks on farm. Um, you know, you're less cost spending on extra staff in the winter, housing, straw, it just all adds up. So, you know, it's increasing that, you know, sustaining, which I think is going to be a bigger thing, not even increasing stock rate, sustained stocking rate on farm this year, which is going to be quite challenging for all of us, but we need to have a bit of a plan. All right. Thank you very much. Anyway, hope, hope you enjoy that. Thank you, Paul. Um, in the interest of time, uh, can I ask you to stop saying that William could share his um a lot of information there again uh just say to everybody as I reiterated at the beginning that there is a brilliant Braska guide on the website uh you know it talks about your requirements your yield your quantities of each species uh, quantities of, of seed of each species how much you have to grow there's a calculator in there in terms of working out how much you're going to need for the winter or the summer period um uh, just a really useful guide so uh, i'd point you in that direction if, if you didn't get all of uh, paul's points then um right william thank you very much we are uh quite over time so um I, I, i'm not going to rush you that's not fair but thank you very much if you give us your presentation that'd be great all right then we've got let's get us onto screen share there you go brilliant okay right i am thanks ben i'm i'm conscious of time as well um Adam and Paul have had a lot of really good information there and a lot of enthusiasm for what they're talking about. Uh, in this last section, I'm going to go back to some of the basic principles um, because despite the challenges that we're facing at the moment, um, if we can't exploit the opportunities that um, Adam and Paul have discussed, if we don't get the basics of our soil health and our grassland management correct to begin with. Um, it's all about managing what we've got and understanding the soils and understanding what we can do. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that and also talk a little bit about a multi-species swords as well at the end. And hopefully I'll cover that question on Clover when I get to it, Ben. So what is the, the, the where's our starting point? Our soils are our starting point and our soil is the, the second most important asset on every farm. We can't change our soils, it's what's there. And um, we really need to learn how to manage them and how to improve them. And that improvement process is a long-term job, um, but we can learn to manage them and learn to improve them as we go on. And it's all about taking the time to understand what you've got. The first thing I just briefly talk about is the soil microbiology. This is a massive topic in its own right, and we could spend hours talking about that, and we still wouldn't get to the bottom of it and understand it fully. As the more I read about it, the less I realise I know about the soil microbiology, and it's something that's going to become more and more critical in agriculture as we move forward, understanding that and helping to manage it to get the most out of the crops that we grow. And a healthy soil is like a healthy rumen. The aim is for a pH of 6.2. The soil micro, microflora are the same as the rumen microflora. They are the rumen for the plants that you're trying to grow. So let's go move on a little bit. The mineral content of the soil. Well, what are we meaning by that? We're meaning about the, the, the composition in terms of the proportion of clay particles, silt particles, and sand particles within the soil. And that's your mineral content. And the proportions of each of these gives you the texture, whether you're looking at a heavy clay soil or whether you're looking at a, a silty loam. That's all about the proportions of these three elements within the soil that creates that mineral content and the soil texture that you have to deal with in your own farms. But generally speaking, in a healthy soil, the mineral content is going to be around about that 40 to 45 to 48 percent of the soils. We need 20 to 25 percent air within a healthy soil. 20 to 25% water. And this is the one that's um, perhaps most debated is the organic matter level. On most healthy grassland soils, and I emphasize grassland soils, we're going to be between 5 and 8% organic matter within these soils. Moving on to the chemical composition, both Adam and Paul have talked a lot about um, soil pH and getting it right. So why, but why is it so important? You can see from this slide here that is the, 
you move to the acidic levels, those macronutrients that we apply either as bought-in fertilizers or as farmyard manure slurries through your nitrogen, your phosphorus, potash, and your sulfur, as the soil gets more acidic, they become less available. So with fertilizer at 900 pounds a ton just now, maintaining and improving that soil pH to get it within that optimum band has never been more important. And with lime at approximately 40 to 44 pounds a ton and where I am delivered and sprayed, that lime is a cheap fertilizer because it aids the efficiency of all the other fertilizers that you're going to put onto your soil or onto your crops to grow them. Without that being right, the rest of it doesn't work. So why do we reseed? Grassland productivity has been acknowledged as one of the key contributors to farm profitability. But what still frustrates and amazes me is that um, we're still only reseeding between three and 5% of the available grazing platforms across the UK. When grassland contributes so much to the productivity of the farms, 90% of sheep diets and the energy in a sheep diet comes from grassland, producing the best grassland that we can is optim of optimal importance for sustainability as we move forward. Now, a lot of people will say that grass reseeding is a cost. I would counter that and say it's not a cost, it's an investment, and one that has a fantastic return on investment. Hopefully we'll show that in some of the, the following slides in terms of the financial benefit you get from having the newer grass species there and the newer clover varieties within your lay, which are going to produce um, more tons of dry matter as at a higher D value. So that's ultimately a higher ME content. And therefore, that's what drives the production within the swords. So we'll look at a new grass reseed. Um, and this, these figures here are coming from the HDB. So we're looking at 13 tonnes of dry matter, 12 AME, really good quality grass. And that's the energy. That's what we're trying to produce as grassland farmers. We're trying to produce energy for our livestock to perform on. So that's the, the ultimate that we can do. Now, if you look at that second bar there, we've got a slightly older lay. It's still a good lay with 70% perennial ryegrass in it. But because the perennial ryegrass content has reduced, what's come in in its place, some of our indigenous grasses, which are lower yielding and lower quality. So therefore you have a lower tons of dry matter produced at a lower AME. So you're losing energy almost just over 48 and a half thousand megajoules of energy. You've lost between that brand spanking new lay that's at the, the, the peak of condition against one that's two or three years old by this stage. And when you take the fact that it takes about 5.4 megajoules of energy to produce a litre of milk, that's how we get to this 9,000 litres of milk that we've lost. And when I updated this slide a couple of weeks ago, I was working on a cost price, a, a, an X farm price of 36 pence for a litre of milk. Um, I hear today that coming the first of May, we're looking at 40, 41 pence. But at 36 pence, that 9,000 litres equates to um, £3,240 of milk value that has been potentially lost from the system. And at 40 odd pence, that's even greater now. And you see there again, once you get to these older pastures, 50% ryegrass, and there's a lot of that type of grass round about the countryside when you consider that the average yield of grassland across the UK, depending on where you are and how it's managed, varies from about 6.9 to just under eight tons of dry matter per hectare. Um, this is still a decent, decent sword on an average farm. But again, you see the amount of energy we've lost there. We've lost 82,500 megajoules of energy. So even more milk lost. And the concentrate replacement cost, I'll, I'll skip to that, being conscious of time. That was based on supplying the same amount of energy that we've lost there, that 48,000 megajoules of energy. To supply that lost energy, we concentrates at 380 pounds a tonne, um, it's going to take you 1,400 £1, pounds to replace it. So all of a sudden, these tons of dry matter, when you consider you, the extra concentrate at 380 pounds, it suddenly puts a significant value 
on the tons of dry matter that you can produce on farm. When you value that you need to replace a ton of grass with concentrate, it suddenly becomes a very, very valuable commodity, the, the grass that you can grow. So just putting some actual figures onto the, the cost of production for um, kilograms of kilograms of grass. And these were some of the figures that I've taken here are from the SRUC Farm Management Handbook. And I'll put my hands up, the guys in the South, they would all work with, work with John next, but being a Scotsman, I've got to support the SRUC. Here we've taken the cost of uh, the establishment, we've divided it by seven to give us an annual establishment cost within these costings. We've got some variable, variable costs in there, fertilizer application sprays, and I've costed in the nitrogen application at £2.70 per kilogram of N, which is working out at about £920 a tonne for nitram. Um, we've got some other costs in there, and then we'll work it out against how much we're producing. So there you see your 75% perennial ryegrass sward is at 7.2 pence per kilogram. Your slightly lower yielding, lower perennial content is costing you more. It's still a decent sward producing eight tons. Um, so those two most farms will have, but where the, the discussion comes in in a lot of places is on these older permanent pasture type swards that are over 10 years old. The fertilizer use, usage has been reduced to 100 kilograms. So they say, oh, we're, we're saving money straight away. Well, in terms of laying money out, yes, you are, but in terms of the loss that you're not getting from the production, you're actually increasing your cost per kilogram of dry matter. You're up there at 11.2 pence in that sward. Another factor to consider is you're growing, you're only growing a third of the grass from your new sward. So you're only able to feed a third of the stock, or if you're carrying the same stock, you have to buy in feed to feed them. So again, it's all about the energy and what we're producing on farm to aid productivity. So just how are we going to manage the grass to grow more grass? Some of you, a lot of you I know will have seen this slide before. Um, and I want to reiterate a particular slide on the right. It's all about understanding how a grass plant grows. And that's what's going to drive performance and up the output from grass without necessarily increasing the cost of growing that grass. Because if you're set stock and you're keeping that grass at that first point in there, because every time a new leaf comes up, it gets snipped off. So that plant is using energy from its roots to keep producing that first leaf. So how do we, how do we uh, increase that and mitigate against that? Well, the simple answer is we want to have bigger mobs of stock. If you've got, if you've got, uh, for example, in the middle field there, you've got four fields. If you've got four fields with ewes and lambs in it, why not mob them up into one and rotate them around about it? And as soon as you start to do that, because of the way that grass plant is growing, it's putting in energy to its roots. So it's growing more grass and you're able to utilize it at that, the right stage between that two and that three leaf stage. And that starts to drive the performance of the swatch without necessarily increasing the costs. And once you start on that journey, you'll start to subdivide more to manage it better and be able to be pre presenting the grass at the right stage all the time. So I say presenting the grass at the right stage, why is that so important? I think this slide highlights why it's so important. Every devalue point that you lift presenting grass to a dairy cow, you increase the production by a third of a litre. Well, that doesn't sound a lot, but when you multiply it up by herds of two, 300 cows over a grazing season, it starts, starts to become a lot of milk. And likewise, if you can lift the devalue of the grass to your beef cattle, you're lifting their live weight gain by 40 grams a day. And that's come back to that last slide in terms of understanding how to start and manage your grass, get better mobs of stock. And once you move to the, uh, the paddock grazing system, which was the, the N1, you're going to be starting to get to the stage where you're always presenting grass to your chosen class of stock at the right at the right stage, at that two and a half to three leaf stage, when it's at the, it's optimum in terms of yield and quality. 
and that's what's going to drive performance and production. Now, we've talked a lot tonight about um, the cost of fertilizer and why we should be thinking about alternatives. Um, I would just like at this point to give a wee plug to HDB. They have put this um, cost benefit calculator. It's on their website and it's an interactive tool for you all to use. I would strongly recommend that you go to their website, uh, go under the tools tab and under the livestock section, you'll find this. And you can put in the cost that you've paid for your fertilizer, the nitrogen content, your other bits and pieces there to give you a cost per kilogram of N. And then you can put in your concentrate cost. And what that will do, well, it will start and give you a guide and confidence that by applying fertilizer and growing grass, you're still um, performing more efficiently than you would have been if you cut down your fertilizer and purchased more concentrates. There's a cost benefit calculator there. I think it's a really important tool and well worth taking the time to have a look at um, after, to, after we're finished tonight or tomorrow, if you like. For a, a few minutes at the end here, I just want to talk about multi-species swords um, and the potential they have for filling the forage gap. Uh, Adam has mentioned and showed some of the slides from the work that we've been doing earlier in terms of the, the, with the, the legumes and the protein and the ME that they have. But just to kind of go back again to the first principles, a multi-species sward at its most simplistic is one grass variety, one legume, and one herb. But we have far more in most mixes. And that picture that you see there, that was taken at Germinal Horizon Wiltshire before the first cut. And we're actually doing, um, we're going into a third year now of trials where we're cutting these, measuring quality, we're botanically separating them to get the, the quality from them, and also measuring yield across the season to try and understand how they all work together. Uh, and we went from a simple, straight, one perennial ryegrass through to um, complex mixes through our Landstrong range to complex mixes with 16 different species in them. So where are multi-species swords going to fit in? Well, personally, I see them fitting in really well on lower N input situations. This was based on 150 kilograms of N application. And this is the work from those plots that we saw in the first slide there. Um, 150 kgs for some context, that was to mimic animal returns and a small amount of added fertilizer and been, been put on in a commercial situation because these plots are not being grazed, they've been cut all the time. But here you see that the, the multi-species swords with the herbs on a low end situation are producing 19 and a half tons of dry matter. That is based on a lot of really good perennial ryegrasses in it, red white clovers, chicory and plantains, along with some of their other herbs, um, yarrows, burnets, that sort of thing in it. The interesting one to me in this one is the germinal mix there, and that was made up before the, the GS4s, but it's a very similar mix to GS4. So again, it's performing really well in these lower nitrogen situations. But when you move to a higher end situation, and this was um, based at 250 kilograms of N per hectare, you see that your grass and clover are back up as the highest yielding one again there for over 20 tons of dry matter. And the general mix and the other multi-species with the herbs were very similar there. So they have a huge part to play, particularly if we're looking to reduce our N usage. Um, and these multi-species swords will have a, an important part to play in that mitigation of lower end, end regimes. But not only are they going to multi mitigate for the lower yield, a lower fertilizer by maintaining yields, um, we're also getting really good qualities here. You see again, this was done from the three separations with the early, mid and late that Adam showed on his um, slides for the legumes earlier. But again, we're producing a lot of energy and a lot of megajoules of energy there with the multi-species grazing mix and the germinal mix again. Um, don't worry about the, the red dots and what, no, this is to do with the statistical relevance of the two different fertilizer regimes, which our researchers can would explain better. 
And for those of you that are really interested in the multi-species, we have webinars on our website that you can tune into and find out more in a great more detail than I'm spending on them tonight. And lastly, in the multi-species, again, this is just to emphasize the, the crude protein that Adam was talking about earlier, the, the impact across the whole mix, rather than just the legumes that Adam showed. Again, we're seeing that your ordinary perennial ryegrass on its own isn't producing a lot of crude protein across the course of the season. But when you add in clovers and some other herbs, you're starting to lift that um, crude protein production. And the crude protein is important because grassland produces more than four times the crude protein that we actually buy in. So anything we can do on farm and at home to produce more, more crude protein is vital. Um, just a word to kind of finish up in the, the multi-species before I summarise and finish is that multi-species swords, in my opinion, they're not a golden, a silver bullet. They're not the cure-all as we move forward. And the reason I say that is that the, the herb fraction in some of the legumes are, um, they're not, they don't have the persistency of perennial ryegrass and white clover. So if you want to use um, multi-species, which I think a lot of people will be looking at, and they are very useful, but I think the base of a multi-species sword has to be based around high quality perennial ryegrasses and high quality white clovers. And the reason I say that is when the persistency of some of the herbs and legumes fades and they start to die out from the sward, you still want to be left with a high quality sward there after the, the three or four years that the herbs will last. You want to be left with high quality perennial ryegrass and white clover that's still going to be there to drive performance with livestock going forward. Just to sum up, it's been a little bit of a whistle stop tour here tonight. Um, regular soil testing, we can't emphasize that enough. Um, everything works better within the soil, the microbiology works better. Um, your inputs of fertilizer are going to be more efficient with the soil pH in that right band between 6.2, 6.5. Um, and the last thing to, the other thing to say and think about is measuring grass. Think about how you manage it. And if you can't, and if you can't start to think about rotating and mobbing up bigger stocks, bigger mobs of stock, you're going to struggle to get more production out of it. And if you do start to do that, start to think about measuring the grass. And the more you can measure it, the better you can manage it. As I've said, there are opportunities there with multi-species swords. Um, I think one of the things, the other thing to remember about multi-species swords is some of the hair fractions are specific to certain soil types and certain climatic conditions. So be careful and do a wee bit of research and know your soil types where you want to put them before you start and go and buy multi-species mixes so that what you purchase, you know is going to grow within the types of soil that you have on your farm. So thank you very much for that. I'll stop sharing and I think Ben's going to take some questions. Um, I've actually made a decision that I think we'll, we'll leave it there for tonight. There are a lot of good questions. I can't really uh, answer one or two of them and then leave it. So I'm going to just wrap it up there. Um, we will answer all the questions and we'll send them out on the email with the link to the to the live video. Um, hopefully we've 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 created a bit of interest in your minds, um, just that there might be some other things that we can do to, uh, you know, on your farm to, 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 to increase the homegrown protein. Um, thank you guys for your presentations tonight. Um, and just again, if you want to get in touch with any of us, then feel free to do so The the website. Uh, there's a, on the tab at the top, there's the about and in the about section, it's meet the team. All of our contact details are there, phone numbers and emails. Uh, or there's a, um, a, an opportunity on the website to ask a question. We will respond to it very quickly. Please give us a shout if you want to talk to us about any sort of forage requirements on your farm. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up there because it's nearly nine o'clock. And I think uh, research has shown us in the past that 
that's more than enough time. So uh, thank you all for attending and uh, we'll say good night and uh, hope the rest of the week goes well for you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>